Uh, take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to um, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I've entitled this message, The Truth War, and I take that title from John MacArthur's book, entitled The Truth War, in which he writes, God and truth are inseparable. Every thought about the essence of truth, what it is, what makes it true, and how we can possibly know anything for sure, quickly moves us back to God. That is why God incarnate, Jesus Christ, is called what? The truth. All truth, therefore, starts with what is true of God, who He is, what His mind knows, and what His holiness entails, and what His will approves. In other words, men, all truth is determined and properly explained by God. Scripture describes all authentic Christians as those who know the truth and have been liberated by it. According to the Bible, MacArthur writes, you haven't really grasped the truth at all if there's no sense in which you know it. That is, you know the truth, and you believe it, and you submit to it, and you love it. Do you love the truth? A biblical perspective of truth also entails, but listen carefully, guys, the recognition that ultimate truth is an objective reality. In other words, there are absolute truths. Truth exists outside of us and remains the same regardless of how we may perceive it. Truth, by definition, is as fixed and constant as God is immutable. That means unchangeable. That is because real truth is the unchanged and unchanging expression of who God is. It is not our own personal and arbitrary interpretation of reality. These days, MacArthur warns, People are experimenting with subjective, relativistic ideas of truth and labeling them Christian. This trend, he says, signals a significant departure from biblical and historic Christianity. And if you carry it, it to its necessary conclusion, it will lead to the abandonment or compromise of every essential element of the true Christian faith. And he says it is another major onslaught in an ages-old battle against truth by the powers of darkness. Now, you probably retained about 10% of that, but I'm going to elaborate. <laughs> First of all, I totally agree with everything that, that I just read from Dr. MacArthur. We are in the same war that began back in the garden when the serpent asked Eve, did God really say? It's the same war that the true prophets of God men like Jeremiah and Isaiah waged against the false prophets of God back in their day, which was about 700 years before Christ was born. This is why Jeremiah, do you know he was called the weeping prophet? <laughs> For one thing, I think he was nearly always alone because his message was so full of truth that it offended everybody who heard it. And he was actually, God actually commanded him to go out and stand basically at the city gates and say this, Imagine if you were a prophet of that day and you heard this man saying, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. So that's what, that's what Jesus was saying. That's what God was saying. The prophets back then were scattering the sheep of his pasture. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me. In other words, these false prophets keep saying to the very people who despise God, the Lord says you will have peace. And to, and to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them, these false prophets, has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Who has listened and heard God's Word? I mean, I want you to know this. And I say this with all humility, but I, I cannot come here and stand before you men unless I have first stood, actually knelt in the presence of God in my office to hear what He's got to say. And then I want you to know that when I come here to stand before you, I want you to know that what I'm proclaiming to you is God's Word. Now, I want you to understand... My words, are not, my words are not anywhere near as important as God's words. And that's why I try not to veer 
at far from this book. I, I try not to veer away from it at all when I begin to, to um, explain what God's Word says. You see, the war that has been waged today for truth is the very same war that Jesus waged against the religious leaders of His day. Jesus cried out in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. By the way, do you know where He was standing? He was standing right, right beside the temple. Do you know who was all around Him? Dozens of religious leaders wearing their robes. And, and here's what He said to them. He pointed at them. And the people were watching this and observing this. He said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You look like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. When Jesus died on the cross... Those same religious leaders believed that they had won the war until they, they saw the torn veil in the temple and the empty tomb. Colossians 2.15 states, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This war, men, that has been waged between God and religion, between light and darkness, led the Apostle Paul to a Roman dungeon where he awaited his execution. Paul declared in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, remember him? Was exiled on the island of, island of Patmos because of his faith, because he contended for the truth. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, he writes, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Jude. Do you know who he was? He was the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ who initially did not believe. Remember, his brothers did not believe that, that he was who he claimed to be. But later, uh, I don't know if they all came to believe, but James and Jude did. Why did they become believers, do you think? Because they saw the empty tomb. They saw the miracles. And, and so Jude writes that little book in the back. It only has one chapter. And so it's Jude verses 3 and 4, and he says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, in other words, what he really wants to talk about, and guess what I really want to talk about, is not what I'm going to talk about tonight. What I would really like to talk about is, is the gospel and salvation, and I will talk about the gospel. And that's what Jude wanted to write about, but he was concerned about something else. Here's what he said. He said, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Ever since Jesus laid down the gauntlet at the cross, Satan and his minions have been at war against truth. And sadly, this war is still being waged in churches and divinity schools all across America. But I want you to know this. It's a war that God will ultimately win. The question I want to ask you tonight is this. Are you really aware of this war? Do you, do you have your spiritual antennas up and you're trying to discern when you go, and particularly when you go to hear someone on television or the radio who claims to be a representative of God, do you have your antennas up and do you know how to discern whether it's true or not? Do you? And listen, I, I claim to be a representative. I feel like I've been called by God to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I'm one of his ambassadors. And by the way, if you're in Christ, you're called to be one of his ambassadors. 
but you come here and listen to me pretty regularly. You really need to decide if what I'm saying is the truth or not. And if you believe it's the truth, then the question is, how are you going to respond to it? That brings us to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Here in chapter 4, Paul once again writes to his dear friend Timothy and warns him about those who have secretly slipped into his church, the one he is pastoring in Ephesus, and calls people to depart from the faith by deception, by false teaching, and by myths. So let's see what Paul writes to Timothy. All right, so 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Here's what he writes. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come from, through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. So if your conscience has been seared, you really can't discern between what is right and wrong, good and evil. And your, your, your moral compass is gone. He goes on, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know what? The truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Now his, I really want to share with you tonight just one truth to consider. And here it is. And it's in your outline there if you got it. We who are in Christ are in a battle for truth. And the Lord expects us to fight for this truth no matter what it costs. And so are you willing to engage in the fight? That's ultimately what I want you to consider tonight. Do you believe, let me ask you this. Do you believe that the same problem with truth that existed during the time of Jesus, during the first century, with religious leaders, do you think that same battle for truth is still being waged today? Do you? I do. I want you to think about this. I haven't, I need to do this. I believe if you go through every book in the New Testament, with the exception of James, because I looked through James today and I couldn't find anything in James where he warned about false teachers. But if you go look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you listen to the words of Jesus, and you listen to the words of Paul and Peter and Jude, they all warned about false teachers. Why do you think they spent so much time doing that? Here's what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2. He warns, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They, these false preachers, will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many, not a few, many will follow their shameful ways and bring the way of truth into disrepute. Now I want you to listen one more time to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul writes, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Now Paul, he mentions later times. Any chance that he could be talking about the times in which we live? When you look at Europe, England, and America, most people no longer go to church. In fact, um, I went to... Uh, London on a mission trip. <laughs> um, gosh, I just, I took my son with me, Smith, and we had to go around. I was really not real good at this. We had to go out and just mingle among the people and try to engage them with a 60-second survey and try to share the gospel with them. And uh, Smith could tell I wasn't very good at it. But I learned while I was over there that only about 2% of the population bothered to go to church. What happened? Same thing's true in Europe. What happened? The Reformation began in Germany. What happened to all the churches um, in Turkey? They're all, they're, they're all, you know, they're in ruins now. And they've been replaced by Muslim mosques. You think we're not in a battle? Paul says that people will depart from the truth because they will be devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. 
I think the problem that many people will have when they hear this kind of language is that they don't really believe. First of all, they may not believe in demons. If they do, they, they would never believe that their nice minister could be influenced by a demon. Who is the father of all lies? I want you to listen to what Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day in John chapter 8, verse 44. Now, I want you to keep in mind, he's speaking to that same crowd of Pharisees, probably right outside the temple. It'd be like if he was standing right outside of a church today, and the, um, they were having a, a conference with all the ministers from an area there, and they're all gathering out there, and Jesus comes out right in the middle of them and says, you belong to your father, the devil. But that's not going to win friends and influence people. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He, talking about Satan, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, again, you may say, Russ, do you really believe that there are ministers today who are under the influence of Satan? And I would say, absolutely. The Bible says that we're in a spiritual war. And 1 John 5, 19 states that the whole world is under the control of who? The evil one. A few years ago, I got hold of a manuscript, somebody sent it to me, of a minister's sermon. And I'm, so I'm quoting exactly what was in his sermon manuscript. God is bigger than Jesus. Right, that's wrong right there. God is not the God of Christianity or the God of Islam, or the God of Buddhism. He is God over all these religions. The same minister wrote a letter to his congregation which said, now I don't have the exact word in here, but this is the gist of what he said. He said, we need to understand that Muslims are good people. And there are, listen, I've got a problem with that statement. And although they have some theological differences with us, we are all worshiping the same God. I've got a big problem with that statement. See, that, my friends... If you don't recognize that as error, then we need to start back at square one. That is not the truth. Muslims do not worship Jesus. They consider him a prophet, a teacher, but they don't believe that he's God. In the Bible, guys, I want you to understand, make sure you understand this. The Bible declares over and over again that Jesus is God in the flesh. Ministers who say things like what I just quoted you are really denying the deity of Christ. In John chapter 8, take your Bible and turn to John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Jesus was attacked by the Pharisees when he claimed to be God. Now I want you to follow this conversation with me. John chapter 8, beginning with verse 48. Again, take your Bible, I want you to follow with me. Because this is the Word of God and this is the most important thing I'm going to say. So, <clears throat> again... The Pharisees are always looking for cracks in Jesus' armor. They're always trying to catch him in some kind of a conflict or, or an error. And so the Jews answer, a, answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? So right then the Pharisees believed in demons, didn't they? <laughs> Jesus said, I am not possessed by a demon, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there's one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I tell you what, the truth. So here's the truth. You ready, men? If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this the Jews exclaimed, Now we know that you're demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. In other words, they're saying, So you're saying you're greater than Abraham and the prophets? That's what, that's what they say next. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? And Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I'd be a liar like you. Joyce at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Now, what he's saying there is that Abraham and I have seen each other. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham. And Jesus said, I tell you what, 
the truth. Are you ready for it? Here's the biggie. He said to them, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Do you know why he slipped away? Because it was not yet his time. Now I want you to notice this. I want you to notice that Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. And so he was claiming two truths there. He is, he's claiming that he, that he had always existed, thus he is who? God. Only God is eternal. And he's saying that his name is I Am, the God of the Old Testament who came and dwelt among us. In case you don't know what Jesus meant when he said before Abraham was born, I Am, I want you to take your Bibles down and turn to Exodus chapter 3. So turn there real quick. And I'm going to do the same thing. Exodus chapter 3. Second book in the Bible. And so this is the story of Moses and the burning bush. Do y'all know who appeared to Moses in, in the burning bush? Right, but what specifically it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the burning bush. And uh, many theologians believe, as do I, that this is a, um, it's called a theophany, it's, it's, or a Christophany. It's an appearance of Christ before his incarnation. How long has Jesus existed? Who do you think walked with Adam and Eve in the garden? The pre-incarnate Christ. Who do you think appeared to Moses in this bush? It's Jesus. And so what, what's happening here, God, Jesus, has come to Moses because the Israelites are still held in captivity uh, in Egypt where they've been held for about 400 years, and it's time for them to be set free. So God is looking for a man to, to send them, to send to them, to set them free. And who is that man? Moses. But Moses is afraid that when he goes to the Israelites, they're going to say, well, who are you and who sent you? So he says right here in verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So let me ask you a question. Do you think the Pharisees knew what Jesus was claiming when he said, before Abraham was born, I am? A lot of liberal theologians say there's nowhere in the Bible that Jesus claimed to be God. Really? So why did the Pharisees pick up rocks to stone him? It's because he was claiming to be God. That's another little thing you, with your antenna. You watch for that lie. Jesus claimed to be God all throughout the Bible. Now back to Jesus and the Pharisees. When they asked him, who do you think you are? He responded, I am. And they picked up stones to kill him. Because in essence, he was claiming to be God. These were the very religious leaders of Israel who should have recognized him. They, had, they knew the Old Testament better than anybody else. And they were looking for the coming Messiah. So why didn't they recognize him? Because they were blind gods. That's why Jesus said, woe to you blind gods. And so let me ask you, do you think anything has really changed much in the last 2,000 years? Do you think that just maybe certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among us? What do you think? When you never hear the gospel really proclaimed in certain places, do you think that just maybe the religious leaders of those places are blind gods? What do you think? Then back to 1 Timothy, chapter 4. Look at verses 6 through 8. You with me? Okay, 1 Timothy, chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. Paul writes, If you point these things out to the brothers, <clears throat> you see what I imagine here, I'm going to kind of put myself in Timothy's shoes. And Paul is telling me, Russ, if you point these things out to the brothers, I hope we're all brothers in here. 
Are you my brother? How do you know? You got the same dad. Who's that? Christ. Perry, are you, are you my brother? Amen. Anybody else want to be my brother? <laughs> I hope we're all brothers, but the only way that we're brothers is if we're all in Christ. C.A. Dillon, I guess you all know he died, and his funeral service was yesterday. And the, in Revelation 14, 13, it says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord. For they, I can't remember the rest of it. You might remember the rest of it. It's worth reading. Nothing on TV worth watching tonight. I've already checked. Revelation 14, 13 says, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. <sighs> mm. Y'all could have heard what was said at that funeral service about C.A. Dillon. He was blessed because he died in the Lord. And, the, and that's what it means to be saved. That means that, that uh, Christ is in you and you are in Christ. And that's how you, we become brothers in Christ. That's why I address a lot of my emails, your brother in Christ. So if you point these things out to the brothers, Paul says, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise both for the present life and the life to come. I said, man, I'm, I'm pointing the truth out to you who are my brothers as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm warning you, have nothing to do with any teaching or preaching that does not line up with the truth of God's Word. God's Word is the only source of truth in the world. And when you invite the one who said, I am the truth, into your heart, what he will do is he will guide you into all truth. In fact, in John 16, 13, Jesus said, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes... Now, he was talking about Pentecost... He will guide you into all truth. So let me ask you this. When does He, the Spirit of truth, come to you and me? At what point in our lives? Would you say, Neil, when you accept Jesus? You see, the moment that you receive Jesus into your heart by faith, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells you. And so when you... Can, can you imagine that you've got God living in you? I can't explain it. That's just what the Bible says. And when you... So you have the Holy Spirit in you. And then, guys, uh, Greg back there was telling me he does three devotionals in the morning, not picking on Greg. He's not proud of it. He was just telling me that. When you read those devotionals, Greg, or when you pick up the Bible and read it, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. And if you would just pray this little prayer before you read the Bible or your devotional, Lord, speak to me from your Word. Well, do you think he's going to ignore that prayer? Are you kidding me? He's up there hoping that somebody tomorrow morning will wake up and say, Lord, will you speak to me from your word? And you know what he promises to do? He'll guide you into all truth. And I believe that affects all the decisions that we make in life that re require wisdom. <laughs> um, a friend just shared tonight in our leadership meeting that he's trying to buy a house, but he, he's not sure if it's the right thing to do. So what do you do? You pray and you ask God to give you wisdom. And I can tell you something, just... If you don't have peace, if you're, if you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit's in you and you're getting ready to do something, if you don't sense peace in your heart, who do you think's giving you that lack of peace? Who's giving, it, who's giving you a lack of peace? It's the Holy Spirit. He's probably warning you, don't go down that path. You listen to the Holy Spirit. Paul calls us to be godly men. And the first test of godliness is to trust in the truth by believing His Word. As we grow in the knowledge of His Word, that holds, that holds promise for both his, this life and the life to come. Guys, this book right here, I heard um, David Jeremiah as I was driving here tonight talking about C.S. Lewis, and he said, if you aim for heaven, you'll get earth thrown in with it. If you aim for this earth, you will miss heaven. So guys, 
I'm trying to get you to aim for heaven, which is what I'm trying to do. Satan, on the other hand, is trying to get you to aim for this earth, and he's trying to do every, he throws everything in front of you to get you off track. So what you got to do, you got to stay focused, disciplined, study his word, have a quiet time, have Christian fellowship, show up for Bible study, do your lesson, because it's designed to get you into God's word, and then you will be focused on heaven, and God will throw in earth too. Look at verse 9. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strain, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. God, I just want to share this with you, and I don't mean this prideful, but I want you to know how much I care about making sure that what I share with you is worth hearing. This morning when I woke up, I used to um, try to get these messages done about four days before Tuesday so that I could go over them 40 times before I gave them to you. And I've gotten so I can do them quicker. <laughs> and I think the Lord's just, you know, showing me some grace so that I have more time. So I've, I've gotten a lot more relaxed, and I'm joining a little bit more. But anyway, so I woke up this morning, and I had about a third of my message done for tonight. That's for tonight, <laughs> this morning. And so I worked all morning, and I got it. I said, man, this is good. And I went home, and I was kind of relaxed, and I've got a book I've got to read for seminary. And I said, I'm going to go and read that, read that manuscript one more time. And I got about halfway through. I said, this thing's really not that good. So I went back to my office at 3 o'clock. And I worked for two hours. Isn't this a really good message now? <laughs> Do what? Anyway, here's why I'm saying that. That is why I labor and strive. Because I want you guys to put your hope in the living God, who is the Savior of those who believe. John 18, 37, Jesus said to Pilate, You are right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Are you listening to Jesus? In Acts 4, 12, it, it said, Luke writes, Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved, other than whose name? Jesus. See, this is the truth of all truths. And this is the hill on which to, to die. And many have died on this hill. Jesus died for this truth. All of the disciples, with the ex exception of John, were martyred for this truth. And thousands upon thousands, upon thousands over the last 2,000 years have died for this truth. And people, listen, right now in a lot of Muslim countries are being burned to death, drowned, and even crucified because of this truth. And we who are in Christ are in a battle for truth and we're called to fight for this truth. Do you believe this? Are you willing to engage? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the honor of being able to stand here as your representative. I do not deserve to be here. You know that more than anyone. But I thank you, Lord, for the privilege. And I pray to God that every man in here, if they're not my brother now, will be my brother before this Bible study is done that we might all gather one day and join C.A. Dillon and Paul Creech and Danny Lotz and David Lewis and J.O. Williams and Dr. John Selhammer, who've all passed away in the last two years and are on the other side in heaven. And Lord, we want to gather one day at the river and celebrate and remember the times that we spent here at Eden Street in Carr Hall studying your word. And we'll be so glad and we'll be so thankful. And I pray that we will focus on heaven and take our eyes off of this world that's passing away. Lord, I pray that you, your truth will resonate in every man's mind and heart as they fall asleep tonight. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Amen. See you guys.